Welcome to RBE 1001 lab number four. This is the second part of the electromechanical lab and basically you'll be building on what you started last week to uh, accomplish this week's lab. This week's lab will be the uh, autonomous delivery of nuclear waste um, and decontamination of the uh, robot for the challenge. Um, you basically need to program your robot to navigate around this field here that's uh, on the screen. The idea is the robot will start um, <laughs> with, um, within one robot width of the nuclear payload without touching the nuclear payload. So the robot can start as close to this as you want, but it cannot be touching it. That includes the arm that you guys will basically be building can be placed within this little area here on the payload, um, but it cannot be touching it. Once you uh, get to that point, you need to basically lift up the payload, navigate around the field, when you reach this line here, you need to drop the payload inside of this area. This is the nuclear waste decontamination area. Then you need your robot to proceed forward until it reaches the robot's decontamination area. The idea is this is a very crucial task and you will only get one attempt to complete this course. Next week when you show up to lab, you will place your robot down, you will tell us you are ready, you will start your robot off, and that'll be it. You will navigate around the field once and you'll be timed or measured based on your results of the uh, robot at that point. So if you only drive three feet and then fall off the uh, field here, you'll be given a distance of three feet. If you navigate all the way around, we basically measure the distance on the track. So every foot of track that you traverse um, is where it'll be measured. So the last place you were on the black line, you will be marked as your distance. Now the slowest time in the world is better than the furthest distance. So you could fall off the line right here at the very end of the course um, after completing it in five seconds, and you're going to do worse than a team that spent two minutes navigating around the field. Um, so it's really important, this is a nuclear reactor uh, scenario, and it's really important that the robot does this repeatedly. Not fast, but repeatedly. There is an award based, uh, parts awarded for the final project based on how well you complete this task. So how long it takes you to, to uh, get around the field or how far you make it will affect your bid order for final parts for the final project. The way that the bid list is handled is that you will mark out the parts that you want on a list when you show up next week from one through roughly six. Each item that you uh, request will be given in an order of the first team gets their first pick, the second fastest team gets their first pick, and so on. Then we'll start at the fastest team and they will get their second pick, the second fastest team will get their second pick, and so on. Most groups get their first three picks without question. Um, it's really just the later on parts where it makes a difference. Now with this challenge, there are no rules that say you cannot dead reckon around the field. So you could technically just drive straight line as fast as you can, straight line, straight line, and try to complete the task. But I will warn you that dead reckoning this challenge will both affect the distance if you fall off and don't complete, um, and it's very much not what we intended for this lab. Although it's not explicitly uh, in the rules that you have to line follow, we strongly encourage you to because you will get the best results. The center of the field, basically an oval shape across the center here, is the owl zone. It is protected habitat for the endangered spotted owl, and it's really important that you do not cross through the endangered habitat. So you are required to basically stay on the outside of the line. Roughly one width of the uh, track inward is as close as you can get to the uh, inhabited area in the center. The payload, when you lift it out of its containment area at the beginning of the challenge down here, it is very important that it lifts straight out of the containment area and does not hit the containment area. If you hit and damage the containment area, then you will get a distance in a time of zero, which will probably put you pretty low on the totem pole. Um, so it's important that you basically lift up this repeatedly in a straight fashion before maneuvering forward. Once you uh, place the uh, nuclear waste in this area, it's very important that you do not drag it out of that area or move it out of that area and that it does not fall over. This payload must remain upright and land within that blue area and stay there um, or else you will get a distance marked at this point here. 
once you've uh, done that, you need to have the robot stop within one robot's width of this final line here. So the robot needs to basically stop within one robot width of this line, and you'll be marked from the time that your robot starts moving to the time that it stops. With the robot itself, you are not mechanically allowed to change the robot at all. So the mechanics, the motors, the gear ratios, the physical mechanism of the arm and the robot itself may not change. This is intended to be a programming exercise, but we do give you the freedom to uh, change and modify the sensor as much as you want. The default bang bang controller with the two light sensors run through a comparator actually works really well. And our record for that is roughly 13 and a half seconds or so um, for completing the field. There are other ways of approaching it, but if you do anything outside of the standard comparator setup, everybody in your group must understand it. So you need to make sure that everybody in the group can describe exactly what the circuit does and exactly how your code works. So if you change it outside of that default configuration and let's say run the sensors as analog sensors, um, everybody in the group needs to understand that. Um, so like I said, only change the code in the sensors themselves. You're not allowed to change the mechanical assembly of the robot. We have had a few cheaters in the past um, that got disqualified. The fastest time around the field was a fully uh, basically modified robot. It had a modified arm. It had modified gear ratios. It had uh, a modified baseline, so it had a lower center of gravity. And it basically completed the um, field in just under nine seconds. Um, so that student, uh, Greg Overton, uh, was uh, completed this challenge, but then was disqualified for his time um, because he physically modified the robot. So although um, we talk about time a lot here, it's actually very much important that you're consistent. If you complete the circle and get to the end, you are most likely going to place in the middle of the class, somewhere in the uh, you know, top 60% of the class by just completing this, taking as much time as you want. Roughly a third of the class usually doesn't complete the field and falls off the line. So uh, a good time for most groups is between 30 and 40 seconds. Um, like I said, the record is down near 13 and a half seconds, and our longest time is up near two minutes. But remember that two minutes still beat any of the distances that were marked. So uh, they still, even at two minutes, actually placed in the top 60% of the class, um, going extremely slow around the field. You will only get one attempt. We don't have enough times that everybody can basically do this multiple times. So you will place your robot down, say, I am ready, and then you will turn it on and it will complete the task. Whether it falls off in the first foot or makes it all the way around, um, it's basically about consistency. So make sure your robot is re really reliable for completing this task. For the actual lab document, if you look at lab four, it describes the scenario that I've just described first. Um, the goals are to be able to calculate gearing uh, motor gearing to accomplish a desired task, be able to design a robot arm appropriate with appropriate gearing to lift up a specific amount of mass, understand and utilize the potentiometer to control the road rotational motion of the arm so that you can lift it up effectively. We want you to be able to program and tune the proportional feedback um, to optimally control the arm. So in future classes, you'll learn about PID, but for this class, we basically just want you to implement a P proportional controller. Um, we want you to be able to program the microcontroller to complete this task. And we also want you to make progress on your final proje uh, project design. So we want you to be thinking about the final project at all times. And at this point, you should be able to basically have a good design for what your wheeled base or tracked base will look like to complete the task. In part one, we want you to look at the payload of the arm and the uh, mass that you guys will be lifting. And like any good engineering practice, we want you to really focus on the math here and the prediction of what you're going to need um, before you ever get to building or designing your system. So we really want you to focus on the math first. Once you've completed the free body diagram and figured out the torques needed, um, we want you to fill in the answer key down here. And then we basically want you to assemble the arm. We give you the full uh, drawing um, or assembly document for the arm, and if you looked at it, you could find roughly the right answer uh, for the problems above. So uh, the arm itself, you have to build exactly as it is described in the building an arm document. 
I will give you a little hint. If uh, you look at the arm construction, uh, it is not completely straightforward. This is the arm itself. And when you mount it here, these three holes are actually the last three holes in this arm. So make sure that those three mounting holes are the last three on this rod. What happened in the picture is whenever they drew lines here, they're actually dotted lines. So that little dot uh, open space in between the line, it plays an optical illusion on where these are screwed in. So you need to make sure those three holes line up with the first three holes on the uh, arm. Once you've completed the arm, we need you to install the potentiometer on the axle. Potentiometers can only spin a finite amount of space, usually 270 degrees. So you need to make sure the alignment of the potentiometer is correct. As you probably saw in previous labs, the inside of a potentiometer looks like this. And as you turn the knob, this wiper moves around the arm, um, around the coil or resistive uh, strip. What you'll see here is that you add power and ground to either side, and this will be linearly proportional to the voltage based on the position around the resistive strip. So when you're uh, hooking up the potentiometer, realize that it can't spin a full 360. There's a physical stop there that won't allow it to spin past that point. If you hook it up wrong, it is possible that you break the potentiometer's physical stop because the potentiometer that you guys are gonna be using on your robot is a lot smaller than this giant one here. Um, so pay attention when you're mounting it up so that you don't break the potentiometer. Um, the payload bucket is roughly three inches tall uh, with a bale that is one and three eighths of an inch above it. So this area here. Um, in your code, we basically want you to be able to read that potentiometer and use it for position feedback, and then also program the robot to do the rest of the task with the line following, the putting down the payload, and then stopping it the second time it sees the double black line. Um, we want you to uh, look at the constant that you use for the positional controller. So the constant is just a variable that's arbitrary that you're multiplying your error by. So that, um, Constant um, can be varied from very low to very high. It's basically just a multiplication factor against the uh, error for your positional control. Um, we want you to basically tell us what gain factor you use there or which constant you used. Then we want you to explain what would happen if the uh, constant was made much larger or much smaller. So we want you to really understand what the positional uh, controller is doing and describe what would happen if you made that constant too big or too small. Um, once you've completed the task, um, we want you to write down how long it took. Um, and basically, we want that to be represented by the time that you compete next week. When you're doing your calculations for the arm, it says basically do not exceed one amp. Um, so you need to make sure that your current draw does not exceed one amp. So the torque uh, value that you'll be using is right here, uh, basically at the 60 RPM mark, because you do not want to exceed that one amp. So uh, it describes that in the document above and just go by the description in the document. Um, as I said, this is a consistency lab, so you only get one attempt. Make sure your robots are consistent and work effectively. Um, a lot of groups, they find adding an extra bright LED to the uh, sensor makes it more reliable because of the different varying light conditions in the lab. Um, you can see different results on your robot. So if you add a super bright LED as a, basically a flashlight to wash out ambient light, you may see better results. Um, so you're allowed to basically modify that sensor as much as you want and the code as much as you want. But remember, don't change the mechanical assembly of the arm and do not modify uh, or the robot and do not modify the arm at all. It needs to be exactly as it's depicted in the pictures. Um, otherwise, um, we'll see you back next week. Be ready to demonstrate your robots and make sure your batteries are charged. Thank you very much.